So another exam question here on the acids, bases and pH topic. So we're up to number three. As always, the link to the questions in the description of the video. So just click on that, try the question and then play on for the answers. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is draw these two pH titration curves. So you'll notice I've got some notes down here. So what the examiner is going to be looking for are the following. So the shapes of the curves. So for the HCl NaOH1, so strong acid with a strong alkali, you've got this classic shape where it starts very low, vertical, goes to a very high pH because we've got strong acid and strong base. The weak acid strong base is slightly different. It's going to start at a slightly higher pH. The vertical section's kind of shunted up a bit, but it's still going to sort of end quite high. So it needs to have that shape there kind of already touched on the starting pH, but just make sure that your strong acid one starts at a lower pH than your weaker acid one. The vertical section is important to you because you can see from the data, we've got 25 cm cubed of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed HCl, um, and the concentration of the NOH is the same. So the end point of the titra of the titration is going to be at 25 so they're going to be looking that that vertical section goes down to 25. The weak acid strong alkali is going to have the same end point because effectively they're still reacting in a one-to-one -one ratio like the strong acid strong base one. Concentration and volume is the same as before so for the same reason as before the end point will also be 25 for that one. And then the final thing they'll look at is the final pH, which I think I've already mentioned, but they're going to want to see the final pH sort of going almost all, all the way up to 14. Likewise there, because you've got a strong alkali uh, being titrated against the acids. Next part of A, explain the choice of indicator. How is it linked to the pH curve? So something like this, the pH range of the indicator must fall in the vertical section of the pH curve. So obviously um, you've got a bigger range here for the strong acid, strong alkali. So as long as the indicator changes colour somewhere there, it's going to catch that magic drop that um, neutralises the um, acid. Likewise here, we've got a slightly lower uh, range here. But as long as your indicator falls within that range, uh, it'll be suitable. Second part of the question moves on to enthalpy change of neutralisation. So the definition is the enthalpy change when an aqueous acid is neutralised by an aqueous alkali, important bit coming up, to form one mole of water. So the calculation now for the enthalpy change of neutralisation. So we're going to use the Q equals MC delta T equation, first of all. So that's going to tell us the amount of energy in joules that was um, generated in this reaction between the sodium hydroxide and the hydrochloric acid. You can have a capital Q there, they're not going to take issue with that. So what's M going to be? Well, it's the mass of the solution. So we've got 35 cm cubed being added to 35 cm cubed. And so therefore, the mass will be 70. The C value, the specific heat capacity we're told is 4.18 forgot to mention when I was talking about mass that we have to assume the density of the mixture is one gram per cubic centimetre, just like water. So whatever the volume is, you've got that um, in grams. And the delta T, we don't have to calculate it. We're told that it rises by 16 and a half degrees C. So that gives us a value of 4827.9 joules. I would always tell my students to then immediately convert that to kilojoules so they don't forget. Obviously, divide by a 1,000, you get that. Next thing we do is calculate the moles of water formed. So how do we do that? Well, we've been given the concentration and volume of the alkali and the acid. Notice they're both the same. So we're going to get the same moles of water formed because of the way the uh, mole ratio works. So that means we're going to get 0 0.084 moles of water formed. And all we need to do now is scale up to what, what would have been produced energy-wise if a mole of water had been produced. So the enthalpy change of neutralisation is therefore minus Q, I'll explain the minus in a second, minus Q, but remember that's got to be the kilojoules value, divided by the moles of water formed, so those numbers there, and that gives us a value of minus 57.5 kilojoules per mole. Just highlight that minus sign. So why is that minus sign important? This is an exothermic reaction, the temperature 
risers. Okay, so a potentially tricky bit to finish with. So the student repeats the experiment using 70 cm cubed of 1.2 mole per decimeter cubed HCl instead of the original. So if you notice how the numbers stack up, the volume's been doubled, the concentration's been halved. So in terms of moles, they're not going to change. And enthalpy change of neutralization doesn't change either. So you see I've written that up there. The enthalpy change of neutralization is going to be the same anyway. So basically, the same amount of energy is going to be trying to heat up a larger volume of solution. So that's why you get a lower temperature. So then if we sort of take the Cutel's MZ delta T expression again and factor that in, so we're saying that the Q value is going to be the same. The M value is going to change. It's now going to be 105, 70 plus the 35 of the alkali. C is the same, because it's the same solution effectively. So we can rearrange and calculate delta T. So there's the numbers in there. Just be careful you use the joules value for um, Q and not the kilojoules value, because we're kind of going back to that original equation. And that gives a delta T of 11 degrees C.